Hello everyone, welcome back to AusBiz Australia's only live streaming business and markets channel. Great to have your company for the next 60 minutes on a program we call The Call. Uh, we take 10 stocks that you've suggested we, um, you need further analysis on. We put it to our expert panel uh, for their adjudication. And uh, we also add in for this week and next week, two extra stocks, uh, stocks that I've have dubbed uh, stocks that can change your life. Um, it all comes from uh, a comment that Henry Jennings from Marcus Today made about a, uh, a stock the week before last, um, where he said, look, Archer Materials it was, he said, this could be a stock that changes your life. And I thought, what a good theme. Makes you think. Carl Kapaluinga from Think Markets is with us, speaking of thinking. And also Jason McIntosh from uh, Motion Trader. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, thank you for, for taking the challenge up in terms of thinking. Makes you think, Carl, does it? As one stock that could change your life over the next five years financially. And uh, I thought it was fascinating. We're getting some great suggestion from the panels. What's yours? Yeah, look, I think, uh, good good afternoon, Koshi, I should say. Um, yeah, I think it's an exciting idea and you're always trying to find that one stock in your portfolio that's going to be the 10 bag or a 20 bag or whatever it is. And I, I would suggest at this stage that viewers uh, be, be sensible with um, these life-changing stocks and, and, and allocate a sensible amount of their portfolio to that, to that oh, stock. So it's, a, it's, yeah, part, yeah. it's part, of, part of your portfolio. It's risk money, but you're hoping that um, it's, it's going to have an extraordinary return. So the one I'm looking at uh, today is called Neo Metals, and ticker code is NMT. And I've, you know, I've thought about uh, this topic for a while um, since uh, your producer said that we were going to do it. And I thought, okay, well, what's going to be life-changing over the next sort of 10, 15, even, even 20 years? And it's hard not to gravitate towards that sort of, you know, electric uh, vehicle, electric battery sort of space. And I started thinking, well, it's some lithium producers. And I thought about this one here, which um, is, is tackling it from a different angle. So we know that we're going to have an explosion potentially of um, electric vehicles uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. Everybody's predicting that. And therefore, draw the line back, you need uh, minerals uh, to produce the batteries, the motors uh, and, and the vehicles themselves. OK, get it, tick, tick, tick. OK, well, these guys are less about finding the minerals and more about recycling the batteries. So if you do have this giant explosion in um, in electric vehicle batteries, well, these batteries don't last forever, Koshi. At some stage, they go kaput and they're full of some pretty nasty stuff, A, and, and B, um, you, this stuff you actually can recycle. So you can use it to build the next uh, next battery and the next battery and so on. So these guys are going for the recycling angle. It's, it's a slightly longer term view. They do have other technologies that are aimed at making the batteries as well. So I guess they, they're, they're sort of making the batteries and then recycling the batteries. They've got a pilot plant um, up and running in Germany, uh, a joint venture over there. They're looking, uh, they're, they're taking batteries as we speak uh, from a number of big battery um, uh, well, recyclers uh, and, and manufacturers. And they're, they're ripping out the bits. They recover about 90% of the good stuff to then uh, use, use in uh, new batteries and looking to, I guess, prove the process. It, it, it's their own patented te technology. It's quite unique. Um, a very low environmental uh, footprint, so it ticks all the green boxes as well. And yeah, look, I mean, it's a longer term view. They're not making any money, money right now, and that's probably a few years away. Um, yep. But mar market cap's probably at that point where, um, it, you know, it's still pretty attractive. Uh, a, a similar company went for about a billion dollars US uh, not long ago in one of those SPACs, one of those special purpose oh, yes. acquisition uh, vehicles. Yeah. Uh, and, and these guys are capped at only 200 million Australians. So if you, you, know, you want to okay. bridge the gap, All there's right. some upside there. So yeah, yeah, excellent. Jason McIntosh from Motion Trader. How are you, mate? Thank you for joining us. What's a, what's oh, a stock that you think could change our life? Oh, look, I reckon this is a great, great idea, this um, this part of the segment. It's because, um, look, this is really a big part of what I do. Like, I use momentum to identify stocks which otherwise you, look, you may have struggled to have found. And, uh, you know, the, the thing with momentum is momentum is really opportunity's calling card. And when you look behind the momentum of the stock and you look, look what are the reasons, what, what's driving it, you can find some, you can, yeah, you find some really, really interesting stories. And so I've got one, got one today. It's uh, it's a company called Klaus Space. Now, Klaus is um, its its ticker code is KSS. Now, it's uh, it's an emerging player in the in the space industry, 
And what it's doing, what they're doing is they're using clusters of satellites to collect radio frequency data across maritime areas. Oh. And, and then it's using that data to detect, um, oh, look, um, to detect and geolocate um, illegal and hidden activities. So these are things like, you know, drug and people smuggling, illegal fishing, border breaches. So it's got broad uses within defence, security, uh, look, the, the maritime intelligence, even um, search and rescue could be in there. And, and so, look, what they've done is they've, they launched an initial cluster of four satellites in November last year. Yeah. And the company's planning to launch two additional clusters. So one is scheduled for for sometime around now, mid this year. And uh, then they've got another one planned for oh, late um, late this year. And so, look, that'll give them a total of 12 satellites. And over time, they're targeting a constellation of up to, up to 20 satellite clusters. So the company says that every time they send a cluster of satellites up into orbit that increases the amount of intelligence data that they can collect uh -huh. and then then on sell and uh, and the data becomes more valuable because it's more in depth so look they're saying they've got strong interest from you know naval coast guard defense um, the border patrol agencies and they're targeting 60 active oh, look i think it's actually 50 50 active subscribers by year end pipeline of 160 that they're they're currently targeting mm. And look, they, um, the opportunity here is huge. So this whole geospatial area, it's forecast to grow to something like 550 billion by 2025. And Klaus Space, well, they've only got a market cap of 150 million. So yeah, it's tiny. It's a tiny mm -hmm. company compared to the, you know, this global address, okay. addressable market. And it's some really good technology that they've got. So they're currently transitioning to um, operational status um they're you know expecting revenues of seven million dollars this um in the june quarter and um uh look this is a company which could do really well over the next okay. next five years Excellent. it's one of those ones ten bag of potential but you know you never know risk management and yep. uh but it's one of those those out of the bag ideas two good two great suggestions uh neo metals and klaus space to uh kick us off today and uh, as uh, Carl was saying, you've got to keep it in perspective, but hey, in, if, you, if you have a portfolio, there's that sort of one or two that you can have a bit of fun with that, uh, that could change your life, but uh, keep it in perspective. So thank you, gents, for that. All right, let's get into the stocks that uh, uh, viewers have sent in and uh, Carl, Tim wants a view on Aeris Resources. Um, it's had a... Uh, a uh, bit of a jump in share price uh, recently, uh, came out with uh, an announcement of uh, tremendous copper results from its uh, mine in western New South Wales, uh, a series of high grade copper intersections at its Constellation um, deposit within its Triton mine in New South Wales, which has got investors excited over recent time. What, what do you think of Eris? Good summary there, Koshi, I should say. I was uh, just on mute for a second. Yep. Uh, look, yes, absolutely. Um, very prospective exploration company, but they are mining as well. So we are producing here. We've gone from, I guess, the blue sky of the first two picks to the brown earth of uh, of Eris Resources. So we're talking um, copper and gold. We're producing about sort of 25,000 ounces of, um, sorry, tonnes of copper per annum and about uh, 75,000 ounces of gold. So put, to put this one in perspective, and I think that's how you have to look at it, compare it to, say, Oz Minerals. So Oz Minerals is producing about, you know, four times as much copper and about, you know, three, three and a half times more gold. So it's more of a, a sort of a junior to mid-tier producer, but the good news is um, that it is producing the cash flows are starting to come in. So uh, again, order of magnitude, if you look at last year's uh, operating cash flow, so this is free cash flow to the business that can go back to shareholders or reinvesting back in the business. You're looking about sort of 10 or $12 million. Um, this year, it's probably going to be over $100 million. So they are starting to hit their straps. And I think that's what the market is starting to appreciate on Aris Resources. We've had them as a buy from about six cents. Uh, from about the middle of last year, we reiterated a buy around about eight cents towards the end of this year, but we still want to stick with it. I think there's still plenty of upside here. Um, some great results have come through looking to continue to prove the reserves at uh, both their, their uh, Triton Copper Mine and their Cracker Gold Mine. 
uh, but that's the key. They need to keep proving the reserves because we've only got about a three to five year mine life on each of those, Koshi, and that's kind of the right. problem. So um, we're looking at about you know four times next year's earnings, which is telling you the market is a little bit concerned that, well, okay, what do we do after five years? So the key to this one going forward is A, the fantastic cash flows, and then B, can they continue to extend the life of the mine past that? In the meantime, the trend is good. So I like to look at the charts as well. So I think it's the right stock, and I think the chart is good as well. Um, nice trends, short term, long term trends. So happy to continue to back it even around this 20 cent level. Okay. Uh, Jason? Yeah, it's um, look. It's been a real boom stock. It's it's gone from a market cap of 20 million to 450 million in the space of a year. So it's uh, look. The copper price has clearly been a been a big factor in in pushing this stock up. And uh, and look, I think um, I think the the copper space generally is going to be a really uh, really good area to be in over the next look over the next next five ten years. So look, this whole decarbonisation trend really seems to be gaining momentum, and and copper's a key player within that. And uh, so look, if we're going to you know electrify the world, it's going to take you know a lot of copper. So you just look at electric cars, for example, and they use something like four times as much copper as a as a regular car. And uh, so look, that's the backdrop for for copper and and the the environment that um, you know the, the company's operating in. And look, there's also the potential of getting a supply deficit in copper over the next next few years because there hasn't been there hasn't been a lot of new copper mines opening globally, and there's not really much on the horizon under development. So, you know that that shortfall potential coming in over the next few years, if they can continue to you know prove up their resources, as, as Carl was Carl was saying, it's uh, look they're in the right industry. It's a it's a, it's a good stock. Don't forget their gold as well. I think there's a good story for gold over the next next few years. Gold and copper now, look, gold and copper are both consolidating at the moment. They've both had big runs over the last last year. So it's a bit of a timing thing for me. It's had this giant run. Um, I, I think you've probably got a bit of time to be able to get this stock on board. It may consolidate over the next next few months with copper and gold. I like it in general. Um, I don't think you need to rush into to buy today, though. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that. 10% of you in. Um, Jason, Jeff wants a view on uh, Maida Group. Um, it's in the ma- a maintenance services company, deals in providing specialised labour for uh, heavy uh, mobile equipment in the resources sector, uh, not only here in Australia, but Asia, Africa and the Americas. Uh, Jason, what do you think of Maida? Yeah, it's an interesting company. It's one of those ones which is... Look, which is pretty hard to find. It's, uh, it's got a market cap of $180 million, not in the all ordinary. So I guess for, for most people, it's really on the fringes of what you're, you know, what you're able to find and what you, what you can't. It's, uh, I first, first came to my attention back in December, seemed to be gathering some, some upward momentum, but then that momentum sort of petered out and it's drifted back lower again. It's, um, look, as you're saying, it's in the, 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 in the resources sector, what they do is they, they service uh, the heavy equipment, you know, things like the diggers, the trucks, the plant, all the big stuff that makes the mining operation work. And uh, they've been around since 2005, but only listed since 2019. Their, their last quarterly results were, look, I think they were pretty good. They had revenue of $76 million, which is up 5.7%. And they're saying they're getting unprecedented levels of demand for their services. So I think that's all, I think the, you know, the backdrop of the company is strong. And uh, the growth area for this company is probably going to be in, in the US and Canada. So whilst they had 50, what was it, 76 million overall um, revenue, um, 5.6 million of that came from the US. So it's only a relatively small part of their business, but that was up 27%. And they're in the, the advanced stages of starting operations in Canada. And you look at the addressable market from those two, those two countries, it's something like three to three and a half billion dollars. So I think that's the opportunity here. If Matter can uh, get traction in those markets, get their market share, start building, it's already doing well and it could do a lot better with this, this growth story. They've got a track work record as well. Their annual growth, compound annual growth over the last five years is something in the order of 25%. So look, it's yield of 3%, um, good backdrop for it. Management have a have a good stake in the company. Some of the management actually been buying shares recently, so that's always a good sign. 
the thing holding back at the moment is there's just not enough momentum in the share price. I'd like to right. see it actually like you know break higher a little bit. I think this is one to really watch closely with the, with the idea of buying. But I think just be patient. Let's wait for the momentum and go with go with that rather than you know preempting yep. and, and hoping it kicks in. Okay. Uh, Carl. Yeah, look, a really interesting stock, as Jason said. And for me, Akash, it's all about finding the right stock at the right price at the right time. So the right stock is, is it in a growing industry, an industry where, where money is flowing into and, and does it have profit growth itself? Um, is it the right uh, value? Is it Are we buying at a good value? And is the market agreeing with us on the chart? So I think it's the right stock. I think it, it's... A, it's it, if you look at you know, mining services, um, you know we're talking about heavy equipment, so potentially also infrastructure as well, um, a, a growing growth profile in the US, uh, and it's very, very cheap. So right stock, right value, right price. I mean, you're looking at paying uh, 0.5 times uh, enterprise value to revenue. It's you know uh, 0.5, uh, sorry, seven times cash flow, um, four times uh, earnings. Uh, it, it's it's just looking very, very cheap. So. Uh, return on equity is, is over 30% because it's not a very capital intensive business. So it's going tick, tick, tick. And, and where it falls down for me is just on the chart. And if I could maybe uh, provide a bit of an explanation for why Jason yep. saw the price start to look good then tail off is it was taken out of the all ordinaries index around about March. And maybe that explains some of its recent underperformance. Once that selling, I guess, de-weighting is out of the picture, you're left with a growing stock at a very cheap price. Um, if the chart starts to turn up, and I'll give you a level, I'm, I'm personally going to watch this one very closely, as Jason says. But if it starts to move probably back between uh, sort of 95 and 98 cents, if you start to see it print, um, you know, high 90s, then I think you do want to get onto this for for all the other reasons I've discussed. So definitely one to watch. Not a okay. buy now, but definitely keep an eye on it. Okay. All right. Just wait to see if it breaks up. Um, Carl uh, Graham wants a view on Eagles Automotive, the uh, the big car and truck. Uh, retailing business got a bit in property investments as well. Uh, we've had uh, record car sales uh, over the last month or two, starting to swing back up during COVID. It was all about used cars, wasn't it? Now it's used car sales have come back up. What do you you think of Egots? Yeah, I mean, look, is it the right stock? You say, is it in a growing market? Yeah, like the market's uh, in the medium term is going to do very well. But then further out, I have to probably defer to the trend prior to COVID, which wasn't great. So prior to COVID, we had 24 consecutive months of uh, contraction in, in the new car market. Um, and then it's only really in the last sort of six months that it started to recover and we're, we're growing again. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. I'm a little bit concerned about the value as well. So maybe it's not the right stock right now. Maybe it's not um, great value either. So um, if you look back at the last couple where you're looking at sort of sing single digit uh, PEs, uh, we're talking sort of um, closer to 20 here. And with an uncertain growth profile, it makes me a little bit concerned. I, I think it's probably... Uh, it's probably fair value right now, which I don't think um, gives you a lot of a lot more upside in terms of the valuation. The chart looks pretty good though, and, and and this is this is the problem for me. So I think if you had it, you would hold it on the basis of of the strength of the trend. Both the short term and long term trends are still going higher, but I think I think if you're looking to allocate capital right now, this is not exactly one I'd be gravitating towards. Okay, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's um. Look, I'd, I'd agree with you know pretty much all that. It's. It's been a terrific growth story over the years. So from you know, 2000, back in 2005, it was a $170 million company, and now it's a $3.9 billion company. And look, I think it's one of those examples where it's really worth paying attention to those those companies which are you know worth around the $100, $300 million companies. You know, these these are the you know the life changes we spoke about earlier. And you know, the idea is you want to identify them when they're when they're small and you ride that. Big growth rate wave, and there's some incredible stories that you can you know you can latch onto. Yeah. But from where it is now, it's um, look. I, I think there's probably some more upside in the the share price, but I'd be you know, I'm reluctant to buy here because you know, you look at where it's come over the last 18 months. It's up like 500%. And look, while the trend's still up from a risk reward perspective, look, I, I just think there are probably better opportunities out there. So. If I owned it, I'd be holding it because I haven't got a reason to get out of it at the moment. But it's it's not what I'd be be chasing up here now. Okay, fully priced for for new investors. Um, Jason Joe wants a view on the Vanguard Australian Fixed Interest Index, um, and and I love Joe's question. He says I was hoping to find out 
what the panel thinks of, of the Vanguard Australian Fixed Interest ETF. Currently returning over 3% per annum, uh, far better than bank deposits, which are just awful. I'm with you here, Joe. Um, would it be a safe alternative to money in the bank? The stock's been trading in that 49 to $53 range of the past 12 months. I can't work out what factors determine price movement. Um, Jason, good question from Joe, because a lot of people, particularly self-funded retirees, just absolutely stung by term deposit rates at the moment and, and, and bank savings rates. First of all, is, is this an alternative? Yeah, look, it's um. So what's what they do? They're 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 investing in Commonwealth government bonds predominantly. That's their their, their core holding. Then there's you know state government authorities and treasury corps and yep. you, know, you know basically it's a government orientated um, bond fund. Uh, look, I, I think it's a I think it's a mistake to to look at a yield of a bond fund and compare it to to cash in the bank. And the reason for that is that you know unlike cash in the bank, the value of the underlying bonds can change. So, so yeah, you might collect more interest, but if the bond yield rises after you've invested your, your cash, if the market, market yield um, goes up, well, then your capital losses could outweigh the income that you receive. So, yep. yeah, the headline rate, rate of, you know, you know I, the running yield they've, they've got on their website is 2.7%. So that sounds great compared to next to nothing in the bank. But, you know, you've got to also factor in what are the, you know, what are the capital movements of the, of the underlying bonds. And I think much of that depends on whether you think we're we're heading for a disinflationary environment or an inflationary one, and that whole disinflationary theme has been you know it's really driven bond yields lower over the last last few decades, but with negative real interest rates really starting to become more prevalent, I think that the you know that that tailwind for in that that case in general for investing in bonds it's you know it's really diminished, and I think with with bonds and bond funds generally, it's all about you know, the, the ongoing fiscal, fiscal stimulus, as well as central banks now outwardly coming out and saying, look, we want to, we want to get more inflation. We want to you know, get the inflation rate higher. And these are both negative bonds. It's not, yeah. you know, if, if you're a bond investor, you don't want high inflation or you know, growing inflation and a lot of spending. And you remember back in the 70s, they used to call bonds certificates of confiscation. <laughs> and that's because you know you had the um, you know the this high inflation environment when you adjusted the bonds income for you know the inflation rate you were going backwards. Yep. So you know not predicting 70s inflation anytime soon. But yeah, you know, that that's sort of the thing with bonds. There's you know there's more to it than just that yield there. RBA's also you know just announced they're going to pull back their um, you know their their buying of, of the long dated bonds. So. Look, my preference, if you're after yield, would be looking at the the property trusts. I think a few right. of them are look interesting. You know, better yields and uh, you know trading below their their net asset value. So, for me, yeah, look, I'd, I'd leave the the bond funds alone for now. Okay, um, Carl, is it too simplistic an explanation to say you get two returns out of bonds? You get the interest rate return, but then also the value of the bond goes up and down depending where interest rates are. So if you invest in bonds which are paying a low yield at the moment and all of a sudden inflation comes roaring back, interest rates go up, the value of your bond now is going to go down in value because new investors can get a better yield from, from more current bonds that are coming out reflecting the higher interest rate environment. So that's what Jason was talking about at the moment, that the losses on your bonds may out, outweigh the yield on them. Yeah, look, absolutely, Koshi. I, I don't think I could explain it any better than, than what you just said. So uh, the, the, the question was about, um, is this investment here comparable to money in the bank? Well, I'll, I'll just say one thing quickly and then we can move on. Um, if you have money in the bank, it's going to uh, you have $1 in the bank today, it's going to be worth at least $1 in the bank in six months' time, a year's yeah. time. Your $1 in this investment might not be worth that $1 and that's what you have to take into account. But what I do say quite often when I come on the show is different products are going to suit different people. So uh, I don't think this one's going to suit Joe because I think he wants that capital stability. But if you're looking for a bond fund to get exposure to bonds and if you have a view that interest rates are going to, going to continue to fall and there's every possibility they continue to do that because maybe people have misplaced this spike in inflation, then maybe this is a good one. But you have to go into this one eyes wide open. Okay. All right. So, uh, and I've, 
What the, the Reserve Bank saying no increase in official interest rates until 2024, still sticking to that. But Correct. groups like the Commonwealth Bank are saying they'll, they'll be lifting by the end of next year, uh, which is very different. Yeah, and we're I mean, starting they, they to see stay. some of those fixed, fixed rate, fixed term home loans already increasing. So markets yeah. pricing in interest rate increases. Look, we can't stay at 0.1% official cash rate forever. So no. it, clearly it's going to go up and clearly there is going to be a lift off and taking that much longer term view, sure, um, yields are going to have to rise at some stage. It will normalise, I would say. But if you go back, as Jason said, we're in a, we're, for the last 20, 30 years, we're, we've been in a disinflationary environment. We're probably getting a bit too macro technical here, gosh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, look. If, if, if the question is, is this like money in the bank? The answer is absolutely no. Okay. All right, Joe. Well, thank you for that. And a really good question and good discussion. Yes. Because I think a lot of people don't quite understand how bonds work and in terms of being an investment. Um, now, Carl, Matt wants a view on Bega Cheese, of course, the big uh, dairy uh, packaging group. They're also in a whole lot of, lot of other um, spreads, if you like. Recently bought... Uh, acquired Lion Dairy and Drinks business uh, back in January as well. Uh, what do you think of Bigger Cheese? Uh, yeah, look, I think I think that was a, a good acquisition for them. It really diversifies them away just simply from being sort of uh, that sort of dairy uh, producer and dairy product. So as you say, we've got Vegemite now, we've got uh, some peanut butter in there, and uh, but they do juices and, you know, go to the website. They, they do a bunch of other stuff. And there's no doubt that uh, by the time you get the checkouts, you have half a dozen to a dozen uh, of their products in, in your trolley. So they are, we're looking, we're talking more of a, a stable staples type of business. Uh, which again suits a particular type of investor. I still want to get it at a good price, though, and that's the problem for me. So I like I like the business actually. I think it's 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 a much better business going forward than it was previously, but I think we're just paying a little bit too much for it. So we're looking at sort of an average PE over the next few years of about seventeen, for a growth for about a nine sort of eight nine percent growth rate, which I think is a little bit too high. I think you want to get it sort of low teens for that sort of growth rate, which means it's too expensive here. So uh, on the basis of the valuation, it's a pass and the trend is starting to look a bit shaky as well. So if you've um, had this one's done pretty well, but I'm looking at the short term trends, they are turning down and in a pretty sharp way. So I'm getting a little bit concerned about even for the longer term holders here, maybe you need to just take your money out of this because of the valuation and go try and find another staple that's a bit more attractively valued. Okay, oh, that's interesting. Um, Jason, Bega? Yeah, yeah, look, it's um, it's really an interesting question in that should you buy a stock as prices are falling as, as Bega currently is? And you know, I hear a lot of times that people talk about, you know, they talk about buying the dip. And the reason is that you, know, you get a stock at a discount to, to what it was trading at like maybe a month or two or you know, six months ago, whatever it may be. And look, that, that sort of approach of, of, um, of buying a dip can work really well in a bull market. And the, the problem is so it can also fail spectacularly. So it doesn't come without risk. So you also need to define you know, what's, a, what's a dip. So is a dip 5%, 10%, 20%? So Big is currently down around 20% from its highs. So if you bought the dip at 10%, you're currently underwater. And um, you know, so if you buy now and it falls another 20%, then what do you do? So you know, this this whole notion of buying the dip, I think it's a dangerous type of strategy, mm. and it's how you can end up getting getting stuck in a stock which is falling for you know for for a long time and and having these stocks languish in your portfolio. So generally speaking, I think the the prospect of something like bigger cheese at the moment, whilst you know, it does some of the fundamentals, you know, some of the fundamentals of the business do look quite sound. It's, um, yeah, look, I'd rather look at a stock like this once it stabilises and once it starts to turn higher and build some upward momentum. So buying into, into strength rather than trying to catch it as it's falling because right. you just don't know. You end up, you can sometimes you end up with a company like A2 Milk. Yeah. And, you know, people would have said, look, buy the dip at 10% and end up down 75%. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to be careful with these situations. But where, you where, need... The issue is where to buy it because uh, who was it last week? Um, A2 Milk came up on the uh, on the call here and it's actually gone into the calls portfolio because the, um, uh, the panel at the time said, hey, it's now so badly bashed around and it actually does have quite a good 
management and, and a good business there. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd, my argument with that would be like, you probably could have said the same thing when it was down 50% or 60% and it's right. continued to fall. That may well be true. Maybe the bottom is in. So I'm not saying it's not, but there's yep. not enough. We don't have enough information on the trend yet to say that it's, that it's turned. Look at a stock like Telstra and AMP. They just fell for years and years and years. Yes. And it, it does happen. And sometimes companies go, go, out, the, go out the back door, not yep. predicting that for A2M. But you, know, you just don't know. So you, got, you put the odds on your side, I think, when you're buying into a rising market rather than right. you know, catching a falling market yep. going, well, you know, it's got a bottom sometime because yep. you know, it could halve again. Uh, better to miss the first 5 or 10% once the trend's established. It's all about, I think it's all about getting that big middle chunk of a trend. So you don't try and pick the low and you don't try and pick the high. You yeah, give back some advice. at the end. But if you can get that big middle section and you and you do that consistently, like looking for stocks where you're putting the odds in your favour, I think that's how you get real portfolio outperformance over time. And right. uh, and you, know, you leave picking the high and picking the low for, you know, for someone else and you end up looking at their portfolios and, and a lot of the time they've got, you know, they've tried to pick the low and they're still holding it 50% lower because it kept getting lower. It's, yep. uh, it's a perilous game picking the low. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's just recap the first five stocks. Um, our stocks that could change your life, uh, Klaus Space and Neo Metals. Um, Eris Resources, a no from Jason, a yes from Carl. Uh, Made a group both um, a no at the moment, but on their watch list for Carl, if it got round down to that, no, uh, up to that 95, 98 cent mark, that looks good on the charts, um, uh, that the trend has changed there. Jason's watching it. Uh, Eagles Automotive, uh, a no to get in at this price, but if, if you're in it, certainly keep, keep holding it if you've ridden it up. Uh, Vanguard fixed interest, a no from both. If you're looking for income returns, look at some of the property trusts, the REITs as an alternative, and uh, bigger cheese, a no from both. Uh, here on the call, we've been um, following our own fantasy portfolio that we've been tracking since the 1st of July last year, thanks to our partner, NAB Trade. Any stocks that get two thumbs up, um, from our expert panel go into the calls portfolio. If that stock comes up again and gets a no from um, that expert panel, it then goes out again. Bigger Cheese has been, for example, in the calls portfolio. As a result of today, um, it then goes out of the portfolio. Uh, let's see how it's been tracking up uh, for the week, about half a percent for the month, 2% since the 1st of July last year up 35%. Some of the stocks that have been recently added to the portfolio, Australian Pharmaceutical, Eclipse Group, Link Administration, Life360, Hub24. Uh, some of the stocks removed, Universal Store, Northern Star Resources, uh, Dragon Tail System, and Today Bega. If you want to take a look at uh, all the stocks in the court por calls portfolio, head to osbiz.co forward slash portfolio. And uh, coming up on the pulse in the next hour, Mike Arked from Research Affiliates uh, joins the team as he tells investors to put money into resources and out of banks. Uh, Mike coming up at 9.15 um, Eastern as he predicts gains in the miners to overtake financials over the course of the year. That's 1.15. All right, let's uh, get into our second five stocks, second half of the call. And um, Carl, David wants a view on a narrow uh, group. Uh, David says, can I have your technical analysis opinion on the chart for Anero, um, who provide integrated marketing and communication services? This is the old photon that was put together by, uh, I think, the, uh, the Grundy uh, group, Investors Reg Grundy's investment house. Um, it's a whole bunch of advertising, public relations, communication, event management companies that they rolled in together a couple of years ago. Uh, Carl, what, what, what's the chart tell you on Anero and, and the fundamentals? Yeah, look, and thanks for David for lobbing in a, a, a question about the technicals. So he's got the right <laughs> panel today. Uh, the technicals look very interesting. So. Um, Obviously, Jason talked about this idea of not catching the falling knife. 
Uh, Nero has had a bit of a pullback over the last month, month and a half, but that pullback is occurring within a, a broader, longer term trend. So that's a big tick for me. We've got this long term trend in place and a short term pullback, and we get these pullbacks. And I'm the type of investor. Uh, when it comes to my technical analysis that I'm specifically looking for these pullbacks within the long term trend. But when that pullback occurs, you need to look for the right price action signal. So preferably, we like to see uh, what typically when we get there is lower peaks, lower troughs on the chart turn into higher peaks and higher troughs. We'd like to see what typically is black candles to get us there turn into white candles. Uh, we're seeing the beginnings, the beginnings, early signs of uh, the right change in the peaks and troughs at this level. So you can see it's just popping up a little bit on the far right-hand side of the chart on screen. Um, the candles aren't too bad, but not great. So um, look, I'm looking to buy this one. I'm actually looking to put this um, as a recommendation for clients shortly, uh, but I want to see it trade back above 275. So I want to see the momentum come back in, confirm that uh, that long-term low at the long-term trend zone that I'm looking at and then push back up. I know the question was about technicals, but this is a very, very good company on the fundamental side of things. So it has um, got great growth in it. It's not expensive at all. And I definitely think it's one you, you need to keep an eye on. Hmm, interesting. I, mean, I, got, I actually got in on the float on this at, at mm -hmm. 80 cents and have just, just kept it. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a bit off off the radar um, in the major part of the market, but it's an interesting business, Jason. Yeah, yeah, it's very much an off the radar stock and, and, and a really interesting one. It's got that market cap of around $200 million, not in the all ordinary. So, you know, naturally you don't don't hear much about it because, you know, most people don't don't know it's there. And it came up in my momentum scans last October. So, oh. so I've known it's there and I've been watching it, um, you know, pretty much since then. And uh, but Koshi, you were on you were on even even earlier from the float. I'm only on since last October. And uh, look, they um, it's it looks really cheap. You look at the fundamentals of it, and it looks really cheap. It's um, it's got a dividend yield of something around eight percent, and it's trading on a PE close to ten. So from that basis, it looks. And this is what I was saying earlier in the show about. You look behind momentum, and you can often find some really interesting stories. And this is, you know, this is a case in point. Uh, they've got a strong balance sheet. They've got 50 million dollars in cash, and they've also got um, what, what's what, what's curious about it is you go, well, look, it's it's growing, and it's got all these good good revenues, but it's only got um, you know a P of 10. And you wonder like why it doesn't have a, you know, a higher higher multiple being applied to it because they've also got a business platform in the UK called um, it's called OB Media, and it helps um, their customers with their online uh, marketing yeah. budgets. And that seems to have a whole lot of potential. So that these are sort of catalysts which could, you know, move it to, to a higher higher PE stock. Um, looking at the, the chart, look exactly what, what Carl Carl said. It's like it's had a had a had a strong move over the you know, the 12 months or so up until I think about March, where it's been consolidating. But you look at that consolidation and you know the pullback. It looks very looks very constructive in that it's not like um, you know, a sharp sell-off or it's not looking like it's like a, uh, a a lasting top. It looks like we had a good run. It's now doing some work. It's some you know just having you know, basically pausing to catch breath, which is what you want to see, and that makes a more sustainable move. Stocks that just rocket higher often rocket lower as well. So this is this is looking good, and I like that move up we had earlier this month so it shows the early signs of some upward momentum building so look with this one look if you were, wanted to be aggressive about it i think you actually could buy it now i'd prefer right. to wait i'd prefer to pretty much as carl said just see up a little bit higher just see whether this um recent uptick turns into something more but you know if you want to play it aggressively i reckon you could buy it now Otherwise, um, yeah, you could you could also easily watch it for another month or two and just see what continues okay. to to pull itself right. higher. Interesting. All right, uh, our next stock um, um, sent in by our viewers is one that's certainly been in the news and been all over the place. Tab Corp Holdings, um, and uh, our viewer John says it's seen quite a run these past six months. Would you see it as a long-term hold if you had made a profit on this one, or is it a sell at these record high prices? Uh, Jason, a, um, um, an outside group came in and uh, Betmakers said, hey, I'll buy part of the business. Tabcorp has basically said, no, they'll 
demerge part of it as well to bring shareholder value. What would you be doing if you if you're in Tabcorp at the moment, and is it worth getting into? Yeah, for me, it's 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 definitely a hold. So one of my one of my you know primary rules is you you let your profits run. And you know, look, sure, it's had a good run recently, but you know you just never know how far a trend is going to go. And and some of them some of them you know go a lot further than just about anyone imagines. So look, the way I think you you maximise your gains, it's very much about not capping your upside by selling something on the way up. So that that's why look, I'm very much a holder because you know the trend of this stock is up. And uh, yeah, it's funny when a, when a stock's falling, people tend to do the opposite. They'll they'll keep, or they'll even you know double up and they'll buy more when it's falling. But when it starts to rise, they worry about you know giving back a you know a decent gain and they sell. Yeah. And so look, I think it, you think you've got to do the opposite. I'd be holding Tab Corp until the market price action tells me otherwise. And look, it's especially so with this. Um, you know, with them looking like what's going to happen with their waging and, and media business. Mm. So it looks like that's in, it's very much in play at the moment. And, and, and anything could happen there. There are, looks like there's three potential buyers. They've got the demerger thing on the table. I think the demerger thing could be a whole, um, you know, it could be a play to try and get more interest out of the or get more value out of the you know, potential buyer for the business. Um, I think getting a buy for that business is ultimately going to be the, the best thing for them because it saves them the whole expense of the emerging. And, uh, and that's what management said. They've said, look, you know, we want to get a, basically want to get a better deal, more certainty, mm. better value. I think that's what the, the merger option is all about. So, look, either way, I think, you know, they get rid of the wagering and media business. They've got a great business in the, um, the lotteries and Kino. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out, but I think the potential upside in this stock, currently as it is as it stands today, it um, look it um, yeah the, the the reward certainly outweighs the risk. So yeah, as I was saying, it's a hold. Wouldn't buy it here, but yeah, definitely keep it if you got it. Okay, Carl. Uh, yeah, I'd probably focus more on the last bit of what Jason said about uh, them trying to get a, a, a better bid for some of those assets. And I think largely they're moving away from that strategy with this de de merger. So not to say that there, there can't be a, a better bid, but I think that's why the price is falling over the last uh, week and a half is the market's starting to realise that this is now less of a takeover play and more of a long-term grind it out, demerge and become two businesses play. And then the market's going, well, do I want to own those two businesses? Now that I'm not going to get this takeover, and I think they're starting to vote with um, with some some supply into the market, and that's why we've seen that pullback. I'm a little bit more concerned, I think, than Jason with that um, trend. I think that the short-term trend has, has swung uh, to, to put the balance of probability more to the downside than the upside, um, and we're looking at a stock that was expensive anyway. So um, with the growth it's going to have, which is mid-single digit and a PE approaching 20, I just can't see the value in here. Even when I break up these two businesses. Uh, into those, um, you know, lotteries and keno, and then the wagering and gaming, and look at those individually and what they're probably going to do. They're still not looking cheap. The, the the lotteries looks a bit better, and the wagering looks a bit worse. But I, I can't see why you would um, go through this process, which is going to take a year, uh, on the basis of not getting a whole lot more out of it. So uh, if I had it, I'm actually thinking you need to go look elsewhere with this uh, this capital. And if I didn't have it, it's passed for me. Okay. All right. Uh, Lisa wants a view, Carl, on uh, Cromwell Property Group, uh, uh, a real estate investor, manager, um, one of the bigger end of town, sort of total assets, $11.5 billion under management. Yeah, it, it, look, we had a discussion earlier about, um, uh, I think Jason mentioned, well, maybe instead of buying that bond fund, look at a property trust instead. And this yep. is maybe one you might look at instead. So I think there's a really good underlying business there, but it is for a specific um, investor with a specific risk profile. So this is not uh, plain vanilla, bunch of Australian um, property assets. They have a huge exposure in Europe, in yep. particular Italy and Poland, which could be a double-edged sword. So number one, uh, obviously they've got some problems over there at the moment. Um, so you know, write downs of um, asset values, um, they're making provisions uh, for obviously uh, 
companies can't pay their rent, for example. Uh, but then there's also the potential upswing and the recovery there. So I think they're probably pretty finely balanced. Putting that aside, you, it, it looks pretty cheap here. So we're talking about you know, very, very attractive uh, multiples any which way you slice and dice it. The dividend yield of about 8%, but it is unfranked. But I think with the fact that the stock is cheap, it's trading at a discount to its net, uh, NTA as well, I think there's probably very little downside in terms of the capital side of the equation, and then you've got the upside from the uh, return side of the equation. I'm having said that, Kosh, you're going to stop short at calling it a buy for me, because I'm not the, you know, I'm not that type of investor. Okay, right. so again, it's trying to find the right stock for the right person. Yeah. I want to see um, great growth and great momentum in the chart, and the chart's not showing a whole lot of momentum at the moment. It doesn't look terrible, but it's not telling me that, you know, we're going to see a, a nice push up, a nice capital appreciation uh, in the short term. So I, I think if you're that type of investor, income stability, sure, go for it. For me, it's a pass. Okay, Jason. Yeah, it's um, yeah. It was there's an interesting development with this last year. There, um, one of the the major shareholders, a company called ARA Asset Management. So they're a Singapore Singaporean-based company, and they wanted to buy a controlling stake in the company, and they put in a bid at 90 cents, and it looked like it was a pretty opportunistic bid. And um, you know, no surprise, it didn't really didn't really um, go anywhere. But I think it demonstrates that there's underlying interest in the in the company around current levels. So you know, that really, I think it really does limit the downside. And, you know, you look at their latest results, um, you know, revenues were impacted by COVID and uh, about two thirds of their portfolio is in, in office. And look, there are, you know, we don't know how the office sector, you know, globally is gonna come back from, from COVID, has, you know, working from home taken off or is everyone going back to the office? You know, we don't, don't really know, it's a bit of an unknown. But, um, you know, that said, they've got that, you know, that, that dividend, as Carl was saying, around 8%, and they're trading at a 10% discount to NDA. So I think part of the uncertainty is already backed into this one. And um, uh, look, so, so look, overall, I'd much rather buy this than, than buy a pop property fund. I think the downside is limited due to the, the NTA, the dividend, and also what was going on with ARA last year. You know, if they were interested last year, presumably they're best still interested in increasing their stake this year. And uh, if we start to see, just start seeing some unwinding of the discount or um, some, some yield compression coming in, there's, there's potentially a, a good total income story. So, you know, a bit of capital gain, yep. good income. It's, um, it's not an exciting stock. I don't think it's going to do exciting things. It's, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it'd be a, a mainstay for my portfolio, but, uh, Look, I, I think if you're after an, after a, uh, a yield, you know, a decent yield, look, it's definitely one to one to have a look at. I think we're, you know, there's there's some upside potential on the chart the way it's looking at the moment. It's um, look, yeah, if that's the sort of stock you mm. want, I think it's definitely a definitely one yep. to consider. Okay, very much uh, similar to Carl there. Uh, horses for courses. If you're uh, after income from your portfolio, as um, and we had the, the question a bit earlier from Joe on his Vanguard Australian Fixed Interest Index and Jason was saying he'd prefer if you want income to go into the, these, sorts of, uh, these sorts of stocks rather than that one. Um, all right, uh, Jason, Rod wants a view on MicroX. I don't think uh, this stock's come up on the, the call before. Rod was saying, hoping for the panel's view, the company provides ultra lightweight X-ray imaging equipment uh, revenue growth is impressive. Um, according to the company, it's, um, it's used across 14 countries at the moment, a mobile medical diagnostic imaging for uh, uh, hospitals, clinics and, and military medical facilities. Interesting business, Jason. Yeah, it's another one of those almost unfindable companies. It's, uh, you know, again, it's got a you know, it's in that sweet spot, market cap of about $150 million. So it's not a not a tiny micro stock, but it's also that, you know, that same, that sort of size that can, you know, can really grow rapidly if uh, if what they're doing pays off. So it's, um, you know, they've got some interesting x-ray technology. It's got applications, and you know, as you're saying, in military and, and healthcare. They've just got um, FDA approval in the US for, for one of their products. So that's... Um, so there's, you know, there's a real story behind this company. They're they're currently um, also trialling their they've got a product, uh, a rover device, which they're 
currently mm-hmm. trialling with the US military, and there's, you know, they're aiming to try and get a, a contract in place later in the year. So look, there's a there's some really interesting stuff going on. Uh, another positive is their, you know, the balance sheet is really well funded. They've got, uh, I think it's $38 million in, in cash in the bank. They've done a big capital raise, and that's why they've got all that cash there. But that gives them a, a really good runway to continue to commercialise their, their products and and develop them and, and get them out there and start you know, turning um, this, this revenue into, into profit. Uh, looking at the chart... Look, I think I think it's looking pretty. I think it looks really interesting. It had a had a strong run last year, and it's been consolidating since March. It's a sort of stock that um, I'd like to buy as it's gathering some momentum. So it's it's going going sideways at the moment. Uh, for me, I'd like to see it break above say 38 cents. Yep. That's you know, it's not too far above where we are now, but just gives some confirmation that the momentum's coming in. You know, we're going with the trend. Okay. If you want to be really aggressive about it, you could buy it now, but my preference would be to you know, just you know, pay a little bit more, but get a little bit more, you know, a little bit more certainty around it. Hmm. Carl? Goshy, it's based in Adelaide. Need I say more? <laughs> you know, great Australian, great Australian technology um, story. And look, they own the they own the tech, and it is it is great tech. So it's you know we're talking you know a, an X-ray machine that's hundreds of kilos that you need to take the patient to to one that's under a hundred kilos that you bring to the patient um, and does the same job. So you know it's really neat. They've got uh, mobile applications as well for um, uh, military applications, but also you can ambulances. They're developing this um, uh, this. Uh, scanner that goes in the ambulance in an ambulance as well so um, it's got great products now um, some that are just about to generate revenue and a great um, pathway to other products uh, the other key thing uh, that jason said is they are well funded as well so they just raised a bunch of cash and they're they're potentially going to go cash flow positive before they use that up anyway so um, they may not even they may be able to start to pay for some of their their research and development out of cash flow. So it's probably a couple of years away from making profits, but I do think it will get there based upon the current run rate. Looking at what I think they're going to earn, probably around FY22 could be a break even, but definitely in FY23, I don't think they're that expensive. I think we're looking at about a P of about 30, which sounds high compared to the some of the some of the stocks we've talked about today. But we're talking growth rates here, 50. 100% time. So yeah. um, that's going to bring its PE down, P down really quickly. The chart doesn't uh, look that bad at all. I actually think the chart looks really interesting. It's kind of pulling back, but just starting to eke back up towards the upside. Based upon how good I think this one is and can be, um, I'm going to go a buy at the current level. Okay. I think it's really interesting. This, right. this could also be one of those life-changing stocks as well. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, so don't just finally, uh, just Carl one Robert one. wants a view on Hydrix. Uh, uh, Robert says uh, share prices soaring after the company reported Angel Medical Systems had advised uh, that it uh, the, had FDA approval for the Angel Med Guardian system. It's a, um, a device which monitors patients' heart signals on a constant uh, basis, alerting them of impending heart attacks. So another interesting med tech. Yeah, look, a brilliant, brilliant concept. But the difference between this one and the last one is that these guys don't own their technology. Right. They're simply licensing it from somewhere else okay. and they've got a seven-year uh, license for that. So that's the first thing I'm a bit concerned about. Um, the second thing is uh, revenues are quite lumpy. So they've been selling for four quarters now and it doesn't look like they're getting that sort of acceleration and traction just yet. So whilst there's a great uh, potential upside, huge addressable market, the the the, the proof's not in the pudding yet in terms of sales. Now, the company's blaming that on COVID and inability to get around and, and you know, and see medical practitioners, yeah. and I get that, um, but I still want to see a little bit more evidence. And I think that's what the market wants to see as well. You can see that sort of um, big tail off there over 2020. So it hasn't got traction yet, potentially on the commercial side, certainly hasn't got traction on the chart yet. And until it does, uh, I'm going to just watch this one for the time okay. being. But I don't think it's, I, because they don't own the technology, that's a big turn off for me as well. Yep. Yep, understandable. Jason? Yeah, so just, just back on MicroX, I don't want the portfolio to, to miss out on that one. So, yeah, put me down for a buy as well. So, oh, okay. So that, one, that, one, that one's in. So All right, Hydrex. what about Hydrex? Hydrex. Now, look, so this is the smallest company we looked at today. It's only got a market cap of oh, something like $28 million. And uh, it's been around for, I was look surprised to see it's been around for almost 20 years. It's... Um, Look, it's had a, it's had a few few upward spikes over the over the years, 
And but like all those spikes have been quickly come tumbling down. So when I had a look at the chart for this one, I instantly dismissed. It. I thought, look, this this be quick and easy. But then I just had a I had a look at the story and look, the, you know, there actually is a little bit little bit to it. Is is kind of kind of interesting. You know, the the biggest thing they're currently got going is this implantable device that can alert a person of an impending heart attack. So as Carl's saying, they don't own the technology. They're the exclusive distributor in Asia Pacific. So they've got eight countries. They're the exclusive distributor for so Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, you know, countries like countries like that. Their revenue's been rising over the last four years. It was up 16% to $16 million in the first half. Uh, they had an operating profit of $1.2 million. Yep. And uh, they've also got close to $10 million in the bank. So there's actually a little bit more to it than I first thought when I looked at the chart. But the problem for me is it's all about price action you know the the stock's still in a, you know, a clear downtrend when you look at it on a you know over yeah. uh, over the last year or two and it's um it did spike higher on the fda approval announcement which came through for this this product they've they're, they're working with but it's look it's given all that back since and for me the the share price for this stock is just too prone okay. to, to spiking up and crashing down right. so interesting but no i couldn't um couldn't go there okay all right, let's just uh, recap the last five stocks. An arrow, a, a yes from Jason. Carl wants to see it, that share price get up to 275 to, to establish the, the trend, and then it would be a buy for Carl. Tabcorp, uh, a hold from, uh, from Jason. Um, Carl saying, saying no and basically sell, take some profits. Uh, Cromwell Properties. Um, a no from both of them because it's not what they look for in an investment. But if you're an income investor after income yield, um, this would be for you. Uh, uh, Micro X, a yes from, uh, from both of them. Carl even says potential to be a stock that could change your life as well. Big tick from, from him. And Hydrix, a no. Carl Kapalinga from uh, Think Markets, always great to uh, have you on board from the West. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Goshi. Lots of fun. Uh, and also Jason McIntosh from Motion Trader. Mate, great to have you on uh, on the call. Catch up soon. Thanks, Carl. Lots of fun as always. Yeah, it's great Thanks, fun Jason. for both of you. Look, if you've got any stocks you want us to cover, put them in an email to call at ausbiz.com.au or tweet us using the at Ausbiz TV handle. All the stocks in the call portfolio. Uh, just go to ozbiz.co forward slash portfolio. Bigger cheese comes out. Micro X goes in uh, as a result of today. If you want a full wrap up of the day in business finance markets, you've got to subscribe to the newsletter. You get Scuddy's View, you get Close of Business podcast, links to all the most popular interviews during the day. Subscribe at ozbiz.co forward slash the COB. Coming up next on The Pulse, uh, we look at the other side of the COVID valley with an emphasis on travel. David Buckland from Montgomery Investments uh, tells us where he's putting his cash. That's next right here on Ausbiz. Don't go away.